Hello everyone, welcome again to uh, Biofluid Mechanics and um, as I mentioned last class, today we're going to go over a presentation to introduce the um, concept and implementation of left ventricular assist devices, which are, is basically a mechanical assist device, a pump uh, that is used to, uh, to support uh, conditions, uh, cardiac conditions such as congestive disease. Um, so, Let's uh, uh, go back to uh, one of our original slides here at the beginning of the semester where we um, summarize the cardiovascular system. And uh, remember that the cardiovascular system is, is essentially divided into two, two circulations that work in series. Uh, one is the left circulation, uh, which is uh, driven by the, by the left heart, by the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, and that one is in charge of the systemic circulation, essentially is in charge of perfusing blood through the entire body, uh, the upper body through the carotid arteries and the subclavian arteries through the arms and the lower body through the descending over to the femoral arteries, including all the vital organs and so on. As the blood traverses through the body, it is, it's actually, uh, and, and goes through the capillary system, it actually oxygenates uh, most of the cells in the body, um, depending on the current conditions and and then um, as it oxygenates the cells in the body it collects uh, co2 from the byproduct of uh, of, uh, of the cells and and uh, in addition to additional uh, tox uh, toxins and, and, and other byproducts and then the the blood returns through the venous system over to the uh, right atrium this is the the, dri the driver of the right circulation the right ventricle and the right circulation is essentially the pulmonary circulation. It's a circulation that uh, the, the blood actually goes uh, to the lungs. It bifurcates into small capillaries again, which are then in contact with the these gas exchange bubbles at the end of the uh, of the tracheobronchial tree of the uh, of the lungs. Uh, these are called the alveoli, and, uh, and that's a a a membrane through which uh, gas exchange occurs in the opposite direction, essentially, uh, oxygen comes into the blood and the blood releases CO2 and other byproducts back to the air um, through, through this gas exchange mechanism. And this continuously happens, as you can see, in series. So as it goes through the lungs, it then joins again into, uh, into uh, veins and and uh, venules, I'm sorry, capillaries, uh, venules, veins, and arterioles, and, 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 and veins that go back into the left circulation and continue that process. In parallel with that uh, series or serial circulation process, there is a parallel one uh, that's called the coronary circulation. It is essentially uh, the coronary arteries which are in charge of providing blood to the myocardium. About 5% of the blood that is produced or that is ejected by the heart is actually collected back by the coronaries to essentially feed the uh, the myocardium or the heart muscle. So this is um, this is uh, in in summary what the circulation system looks like. And and but remember that uh, the left heart, as is shown in this picture, is far stronger than the than the right heart. The the right atrium and the right ventricle actually have much of the uh, myocardium, as it is actually in charge of of producing most of the heart ejection. And 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 uh, and also uh, withstanding the resistance of the systemic circulation. Remember that the systemic circulation offers about eleven times or so more resistance than the pulmonary circulation. Uh, to get the blood to perfuse through the entire body it takes eleven times more power than to do so through the lungs. Um, so therefore, the left ventricle has to be <coughs> a, a, a lot stronger. In addition to that. The left ventricle is actually imposed with a lot more load and is exposed to a lot more problems uh, such as congestive disease. So when somebody suffers a heart infarction, what mainly actually suffers is the left side of the heart. And that's uh, this, this particular uh, piece of the myocardium here, this particular part of the smooth muscle of the heart is actually uh, damaged or, 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 or partially damaged. So one of the solutions uh, to these problems um, is that patients with end-stage congestive heart failure awaiting heart transplantation often wait long periods of time 
one year on average. So in the United States, the average time to wait for a heart transplant when somebody has suffers a, a, a very severe congestive disease or, or end stage congestive disease, um, it takes about a year. Um, so before a suitable donor actually comes available, becomes available with a, with a, with a compatible heart. The medical community has placed increased emphasis on the use of left ventricular assist devices, and that's the short for that is LVAD, that can be a substitute for or enhance the function of the natural heart while patients, while a patient is waiting for the heart, for the heart transplant. Now, in the in the old days, uh, when I say the old days, when these first when these machines were uh, originally developed, they were developed with the idea of being a bridge to transplantation, essentially something that was put in place to keep the patient alive until a suitable donor came about. Um, but with uh, optimization and, and, and mechanical improvements to this device and in terms of the reliability and the functioning and so on, these machines have actually become more of a uh, end, end type of uh, therapy uh, so that uh, in, in, with, with current state-of-the-art uh, technology, patients are actually fitted with these machines and and uh, can actually be an end type of therapy where where patients can live the rest of their lives and almost live a normal life with uh, with one of these LVADs implanted. So this is a picture of a current state-of-the-art type of uh, left ventricular assist device, and as you can see, it's a very simple mechanical pump. Um, it's, uh, it's a continuous flow, uh, axial pump, axial meaning that the flow, the intake is in the same axis as the outflow, um, and impellers are actually designed uh, for that purpose. It's continuous flow, in the same <clears throat> indicating basically that it, it spins at a particular speed that can be controlled externally uh, through a controller, either manual or automatic. Um, but the fact that it spins at a, at a constant speed doesn't mean that the flow that would output will be the same all the time because it all depends on what it's actually receiving. Now, keep in mind that, uh, well, this is the inflow cannula. The inflow cannula is, uh, is implanted on the apex of the, of the ventricle, on the bottom side of the ventricle, to collect the blood available or some of the blood available in the ventricle. And then, um, and then the outflow cannula, which comes out of the outflow uh, docked on the on the on the uh, continuous flow on the axial pump is implanted with a Gore-Tex uh, shunt into the um, uh, into the apex of the aorta right here at this location in the aorta. Now, <clears throat> again, keep in mind that uh, the heart actually there's a there's a congestive disease in the heart when these when these uh, apparatus is implanted, but the heart might be actually partially functioning. There might be enough strength in the ventricle to produce some sort of flow ejection, to produce some cardiac output on its own, not enough to satisfy the physiological demand of the person. So this is basically aiding that amount of flow rate. It's actually enhancing the amount of flow rate that the heart can produce. Now, because the heart is actually working and the aortic valve opens and closes, not maybe not at every heartbeat, but it opens and closes to produce a certain amount of, of, of heart ejection, of uh, cardiac output, the available blood in the ventricle actually changes depending on the location of the heart cycle. And as it changes, the pressure, the availability of pressure here and the supply of blood actually changes. So even though this pump is a continuous flow pump, it is designed to be a continuous flow pump that produces a constant pressure uh, at the, out, uh, the outlet and a constant flow at the outlet. Because of the inlet change, the inlet changes actually as a function of the cardiac cycle itself, the outflow, the resulting outflow, would actually also be a function of time. So it, it, it is designed to be a continuous flow pump, but it actually in practice when it's implanted, it doesn't operate as a continuous flow pump. It actually has a, a, a heartbeat, essentially, because of the flow that actually, because of the supply of blood is exposed to the, to the uh, cycle of the heart. Now, this picture here is for the Bakey Elvet. It's one of those uh, one of the state of the art uh, pumps that is used nowadays. There's also there's a few companies here in the United States and in Europe that uh, fabricate these pumps. Uh, there's the the HeartMade and the HeartMade Two, which is uh, very pervasive in, in the market, the medical market. <clears throat> these are very similar designs, 
but this is one of the first ones that was actually conceived to be an actual flow, continuous flow, uh, continuous flow pump. Um, and, and the original designs were actually uh, made as uh, pulsating pumps to 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 actually be in synchrony with the with the heart cycle. So they were fitted as a, either a membrane or a pulsatile pump that uh, that would have a control system, uh, maybe through a pacemaker, that would allow the pump to actually pulsate at the same rhythm of the heart. So it was believed at the time that if you produce a continuous flow uh, signal, you might actually damage some of the circulatory system or the patient might not react the same. But it turns out that that's not the case, that there's a further clinical studies after over the last 30 years have demonstrated that it's okay with the, that these is, this machine is a continuous flow pump. Now, furthermore, uh, continuous flow pumps, actual pumps like this is, are far more reliable than a pulsatile pump, like a membrane pump that actually pumps up and down. And, and therefore they actually can live for years or decades. And therefore these actually allowed and opened the door for these type of therapy to become end therapies, to become bridge to either bridge to recovery or a destination therapy. Bridge to recovery, essentially, well, uh, implant these, these, uh, this device and uh, maybe the heart will recover at some point uh, with some additional therapy. And if it does, then remove it. And destination therapy basically means, okay, implant this device. The heart might be completely damaged, but this device will actually help the person live uh, uh, a, a relatively normal life uh, until the uh, 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 for the rest of their lives. So this is a, a uh, simulation or basically an animation of how the, the heart actually functions and the, the left ventricle notice uh, is in synchrony with the, with the right ventricle. They all actually beat at the same time. So as the flow exits the aortic valve, it goes through the aorta as we've seen in our many, many simulations. But if this uh, part of the heart muscle uh, suffers uh, some kind of a, a damage, then it basically diminishes the action of, these, of the pumping and essentially preventing the heart from providing enough uh, blood to satisfy the physiological demand of the person. So what is done is then there's a the parallel uh, circuit line to the parallel branch to the circuit in which blood is collected from down here from the ventricle and actually sent over as an addition to the total flow ejection or the cardiac output and producing what's called a total blood flow into the circulation that hopefully will satisfy the physiological demand. So how do we know that this will satisfy the physiological demand? We know that physiological demand changes depending on the level of activity of the person. So if a person is resting or laying down, the physiological demand might be three or four liters per minute. The heart itself might be able to produce that, or maybe with a minimal amount of help from the pump, the heart will, the, 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 the total ejection will be sufficient to satisfy that demand, right? So the pump must be set at a particular setting that actually produces that amount of blood, not too much. Uh, because then it, it will, you will supply too much blood to the system. And when you, when you try to supply too much blood to the system, you actually run out of blood to draw from. And that produces something called a suction effect. The suction effect is something when you try to draw too much blood from the ventricle, more than what is available, and it basically collapses the ventricle. And that's, a, that's deadly. So that's something that needs to be looked at and something that needs to be studied and uh, and analyze in a in a feedback control system that that sets the tone or sets the uh, the uh, the power for these pump. Now, if the patient or the person actually goes into a, a certain level of activity, starts walking or even climbing stairs or something like that, then the 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 systemic resistance of the patient goes down. It, the the body needs more blood. The the heart needs to supply more blood, and the ventricle is not. Uh, capable of doing so and therefore this pump actually supplies that additional blood to satisfy that demand but now the pump needs to be dialed to a higher to a higher setting um, and the higher setting depends again on the on the uh, on the state or the the level of activity of the person so these these uh, these uh, particular process and as you can see there's a very uh, there's a close feedback control system here that needs to be set up for the person to actually, for the pump to actually operate automatically as the person changes the level of activity. And this is something that uh, I've been working on with some with collaborators for for the past decade, 
into implementing a, a automatic control loop into a system because uh, the state of the art of these is, is, is basically an external and if you if you look at the prior slide let's go back to the prior slide if you look at these uh, what the, the 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 pump is actually implanted internally directly at the heart and there's a little cable that comes out out of the person's body that connects to a controller and a set of batteries so the person carries the batteries in a backpack in a controller and a pouch now that controller basically has a dial and the person actually not the person but a nurse or or a practitioner can actually uh, set the dial depending on what the person is supposed to do but what if the person uh, involuntarily changes the level of activity and then the pump is actually set for a low level of activity the pump cannot adapt itself and the person will faint because the the heart will not produce enough blood for the person to satisfy the demand. So these are the type of things that I will show you in some uh, future presentations on, on, on current research and current state of the art in these types of technology. So the idea today is to actually present these, uh, these the concept of the, and the implementation of love ventricular assist device and, and how we actually go about modeling this in our uh, lung parameter models and our cardiovascular circuit models. Okay. So, moving forward, this is um, the uh, five degree of freedom or the five state variable simplified lung parameter model of the cardiovascular system that we have been looking at for the last couple of lectures. Um, it's a system that includes, well, we, I actually drew it here in reverse, and the way I drew it in the notes during the lectures is, uh, is opposite to this. So think of the flow going now from, from right to left instead of from, from left to right. So we start at location one, where we have the state variable number one, Y1, which is the pressure of the left atrium. Then we have the mitral valve and its corresponding resistance going into the left ventricle. So state variable number two, Y2, is the pressure of the left ventricle. Now the compliance of the left ventricle is that uh, time variable compliance dictated by the double heel function, Mr. Jubilus double heel function of the elastins. Then after it goes to the ventricle, it moves into the aortic valve and its corresponding resistance and goes into the aorta. So the state variable number three, Y3, is the pressure of the aorta and connected to its corresponding compliance. Um, then after it goes from the, uh, from the aorta, it traverses the resistance of the aorta and the inductance of the aorta, leading to the fourth state variable connected to that inductance, which is the flow through the aorta, that is the heart ejection. In the case of no LVAD, that will be the total heart ejection. And then after it does that, it goes through the compliance and the resistance of the systemic circulation, leading to the fifth state variable, which is the pressure at the, at the systemic circulation. And again, this systemic system here, or the systemic uh, RC uh, elements, the resistance and the compliance, basically encompass everything in the systemic circulation. So from the arterial system, the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, the veins, including the right heart so it, it includes all the stuff in the right heart including the right atrium the right ventricle the two valves the pulmonary circulation everything is actually encompassed in the systemic uh, resistance and compliance again this is a most simplified version that we can conceive of the of the cardiovascular circulation in a long parameter model one that actually bundles everything else into the systemic circulation now if we were to implant a left ventricular assist device and LVAT and draw blood from here, from the apex of the ventricle and send it to the apex of the, of the aorta, of the ascending aorta, then it would look like something like this. So you will collect blood in parallel while these circuits still functioning in series uh, through the systemic circulation, will collect some blood from the ventricle, send it over some cannulas. So there's the inflow cannula that has its own inductor and resistance. There's a pump uh, or pressure generator that basically models the, the LVAD itself. And then there's an outflow cannula that has its own inductor and resistor, LO and RO, that goes back into the aorta. And the circuit will connect basically a parallel branch coming out of the left ventricle and going into the aorta directly on those nodes. So from the pressure of the left ventricle to the pressure of the aorta, there's a parallel branch with an inflow cannula and that has an inflow um, inductor and an inflow resistor. There is no compliance because the cannula is solid, it's rigid, so it doesn't comply. Then it goes through the pump itself, H, and then after it goes through the pump, it goes through the resistance 
uh, of the outflow cannula and the inductor of the outflow, outflow cannula, uh, even though it's a cortex cannula that is actually malleable, it is not compliant, so there's no compliance for the for the outflow cannula, and then connect it back into the aorta. So it's a very simple parallel branch to the circuit that we already have, and it leads to a new set of degrees of freedom, right? So before we had five degrees of freedom, all the way from Y1 to Y5, five state variables. Now we'll see what, how many additional degrees of freedom we get out of these. By inspection, we can see that there's two inductors, and therefore there should be two flows, two degrees of freedom, two additional state variables, QI and QO. But if you look at it, since there's no diversions and there's no bifurcations anywhere, the flow through, Q, uh, through LI should be identical to the flow through LO. It is the same amount of flow that goes from here to here because there's no bifurcations and stuff. So basically what we'll end up is with a list of new state variables. Y1 through Y5 is the already existing in the same order as we defined them before, the left atrial pressure, the left ventricular pressure, the left the, the aortic pressure, the aortic flow and the systemic pressure. And the new state variable is a single flow that we call QP, which is just the pump flow. The flow, let's go back to one slide, is the flow that goes through the pump or H, um, and we I, I call it H this time because it's, it's basically a, a hydrodynamic head that is producing a pump uh, instead of directly a pressure. Uh, we, we, we normally refer to these in units of heads of millimeters of mercury uh, gain that is produced in a, in a pump. Um, again, because we, we still have two inductors and therefore we should have two additional flows, but these inductors actually see the same amount of flow and therefore we can actually combine them into one as we'll see in the formulation in a minute. So the new variable, the sixth variable, uh, Y6, is just simply QP, is LVAT pump flow in milliliters per second. All right, so let's look at the equation. So again, let's go back a couple of slides, and as we can see, we are connecting a parallel branch from this node to this node, node um, uh, left ventricle to node aorta. So we know that the pressure in the left ventricle is a state variable, it's Y2, and the pressure in the aorta is another state variable, Y3. So we can actually, uh, using, using Ohm's law and using Henry's law, we can calculate the pressure drop from Y2 to Y3, from the pressure of the left ventricle to the pressure in the aorta, as a combination of what happens in these uh, particular uh, inductors and resistors, as well as the gain produced by the pump itself. So this is how it goes. The pressure in the left ventricle minus the pressure in the aorta, the pressure drop between those two, because that's the direction of the flow, either to the bottom branch or to the LVAT branch. By using Ohm's law, it would be the resistance of the in inlet, inlet cannula um, times QP and the resistance of the outflow cannula times QP. Using Henry's law, it would be the inductor of the inflow cannula times the QDT plus the, inducted, the inductor of the outflow cannula times the QDT. That Q is the Q that goes through the pump. In addition, we have a resistor, a corresponding resistor, and a corresponding inductor inherent to the machine itself, inherent to the pump. And we are going to call those RP and LP. So there's a resistor internally, internal resistor to the pump, we call RP, and there's an inductor uh, internal to the pump, which we call LP. And in addition to that, there's a pressure gain or a head gain, and we call that HP. Okay, that's what we've been calling in, in, our, in our prior exercises, delta P of the pump. But instead of calling it delta P, let's just call it H. It's just a hydrodynamic head. Okay, remember the delta P and head are essentially the same, but, uh, but normalized or scaled to the density of a working fluid or, or, or a reference fluid and, uh, and gravity. In this case, since we use millimeters of mercury as the units for pressure gain, it is formally a head gain instead of a pressure gain. All right. Now this is negative because we're looking at pressure drop and the pump produces a gain. So it's a negative of a drop, a gain. All right, so we can combine all these things. Uh, HP is the pressure head gain across the, across the pump and QP is the blood flow through the pump. Um, the parameters RI, R0, or RO, and RP represent the flow resistances, while LI, LO, and LP represent the flow in inertances or inductances of the inlet cannula, outflow cannula, and pump, respectively, as I already mentioned. Um, the typical parameters for adult implementations or applications of these, of these uh, pumps um, are as follows. The inflow cannula has a resistance of 0 0.0677 millimeters of mercury per milliliter second. And uh, 
So as compared, for example, to the uh, systemic circulation resistance, uh, systemic circulation can be uh, anywhere between 0 0.5 and 2, depending on the level of activity. So this is an entire order of magnitude or more below the systemic resistance. Um, the pump itself produces a larger resistance, but twice as much or more as the inflow cannula and the out uh, outflow cannula. In terms of in in inertances or inductances, the inflow and outflow cannula produce about the same or have about the same inductance, 0 0.0127, and while the pump itself has about twice as much, almost twice as much, that uh, that inductance, which is 0 0.02177. Again, those are in units of millimeters of mercury per milliliter second square. Okay, so if we notice that equation that we uh, formulated here, we can combine all this QP. We take a common factor QP and that will add RI, RO, and RP, and we take a common factor D, DQ, DT, and that will take uh, that will multiply a factor LI, LO, and LP. And that's obviously the case because these are all in series. So the inlet cannula, the pump, and the outflow cannula are all in series with each other, and therefore the resistors add up and the inductors add up. So as we go into the formulation, we'll see that uh, the new equation would be that the pressure drop between the left ventricle and the aorta through the upper branch, through the elba branch, will be some R star times QP plus L star times the QT, the QDT, minus the head gain uh, through the pump itself. Where these R star and L star are basically the sum of the resistors and the inductors respectively. So it's pretty uh, easy additional formula. Now notice that this formula now not, doesn't need to actually be altered using KBL or KCL. Why? Because it only includes uh, already existing state variables. Uh, PLV is state variable number two, PAO is state variable number three, and QP is the new state variable number six. So we don't need any uh, additional implementation of the, of the KCL and KBL to, uh, to alter this formula to eliminate any unknowns from it. However, if you look at the circuit itself, the equation that corresponds to, for example, the Q that is diverted into uh, the, the uh, left, ventric left ventricle that comes out of the mitral valve and then goes into the aortic valve now has an extra bifurcation. So the flow that comes into this node is actually diverted into the flow that goes into the left ventricle, it goes into the aortic valve, and it goes now into the L branch. So an additional term that into that in that uh, in that particular KCL uh, implementation on the LV node on the left ventricular node needs to happen. In addition to that, on the next equation, right, equation number three. So equation number two will change. Equation number three, that's row number two in the matrix and row number three in the matrix, will also change because now we have an additional element or an additional branch here coming into this node. So into this node we have coming in. We have the uh, the flow that comes through the aortic valve. In addition to that, we have the flow that comes out of the outflow cannula. And going out, we have the flow going into the aortic compliance and the flow going into the aorta itself. So two coming in and two coming out. So we have an additional term uh, that uh, that is uh, um, uh, that it, that um, is a function of the flow of the pump QP, which is a new state variable that comes into play in the application of KCL and the node of the aortic valve and in the node of the left ventricle. So this is the equation. This will be basically equation number six, pretty simple. So equation number six, as you can see, if you isolate the QDT and take the L star as a denominator of everything else, will just simply look like this, just three additional terms. One over L star that multiplies uh, the pressure of the, in the uh, left ventricle, minus 1 over L star that will multiply the pressure in the aorta, and then minus R over L star that will multiply the flow uh, on the pump, QP, or Y6. Now equations 2 and equation 3 are the same as before, except that they have an additional element here, an additional element that multiplies, or additional uh, coefficient that multiplies Q, uh, that multiplies Y6, the new, uh, the new uh, uh, state variable. The, the flow of the pump. So in the case of uh, in the case of equation number two, it will be minus one over the of the um, uh, compliance of the left ventricle multiplying the flow uh, that uh, that leaves to the uh, to the elbow. And in the case of Q three uh, or equation number three, you have one over 
the compliance of the aorta that multiplies the flow that comes into uh, that node from the alveoli. Okay, so this is just basically the six column and the six row of this matrix are now different. So no different. We have a we have a new row in the in the system of equations, and we have a new column, and the column is altered this particular way. Uh, now the right hand side is slightly different. Remember that the right hand side of the equation, the uh, the vector of independent terms, included these heavy side step functions or the the, the step functions for the for the um, uh, for the valves. Uh, Heavy side y1 minus y2 is the mitral valve, while heavy side y2 minus y3 is the aortic valve. Now, depending on the switch states, depending on the condition of these valves, we'll actually push, we would push these particular coefficients back into the matrix because this is state variable 2 and state variable 3, uh, and state variable 1 and state variable 2. So these are, would actually be complementary uh, coefficients, these into the, into the matrix itself. Now, if all the valves are closed, during the period of uh, isovolumic contraction or isovolumic relaxation, both valves are closed, so all of these are zero, the matrix will remain this way, okay? Now we have an additional term on the right-hand side vector, which is, which is this. Now we have an external source, which is the head gain provided by the LVAD, provided by the pump, divided by the compliance, by the inductance of the pump itself, okay? That came directly out of this equation. Right, so when we when we take that equation and isolate dQ dt on the left hand side, on the right hand side we have a collection of state variables, p plb, pao, qp, multiplying corresponding coefficients, and we'll also have hp positive divided by l star on the right hand side, and that actually remains on the right hand side vector of independent terms. It has nothing to do with how everything is switching. It has nothing to do with the valves. As the valve switches from zero to one. Or from one to zero, these elements actually are moved into the matrix as switch state systems. Uh, but this one actually remains as the sixth element of the right hand side vector of, of independent terms. So recall that the state of the mitral valve, H Y1 minus Y2, and aortic valve, H of uh, Y2 minus Y3, uh, can be used to transform the nonlinear system into a set of switch linear systems. So again, depending on what uh, uh, the value of these valves is if it's zero or one, the matrix will actually change, and we we uh, we went uh, through that in detail by um, formalizing this and and, uh, and and formulating what's a one, a two, a three, a four. Given what that one is, this is this is a state in which it's a switch state in which both valves are open. Two is when the mitral valve is open and the aortic valve is closed. Three is when the aortic valve is open and the mitral valve is closed. And four is when we both valves are closed. Now, in any case, as we switch the states, the right-hand side vector will always look like this. So everything becomes zero on the right-hand side vector, as we did in the previous lectures. But there will be an element on the sixth term, or on the, on the sixth element of these of this right-hand side vector that is actually a function of these of this pump head gain divided by its own inductance. So this will always be acting as an external source pushing blood through the system. Now, how do we model this? Now, we say that this is a continuous flow pump. Now, a continuous flow pump, usually we can, we can model these head gain or these uh, delta P uh, of the pump as, an, as a value. We can say, okay, this these pump augments the system by a 20 millimeters of mercury or 40 millimeters of mercury, and that's what the pump does. And then introduce that value here if it's a constant. But as I mentioned, even though this is a continuous flow axial pump, it doesn't act as such because the flow that it receives or the supply of blood in the inflow cannula changes as a function of the heart rhythm itself. So the, the blood actually, or the pump actually acts as a pulsatile pump, even though it's not mechanically designed to be so. So the way to model this as a continuous axial flow pump, the elvat head gain cannot be directly adjusted or controlled. We cannot set the dial and say, okay, adjust to 20 millimeters of mercury or 30 or 40. What we can do is basically adjust the amount of current that we supply to the motor that drives this pump. So instead, the control of the elvat pump is made through the electric current I passed through the pump motor such that the motor power results in the following. So this is a mechanical pump that is connected to a, an electric motor that has that is connected to a battery that actually has an amount of current that we can control to 
and uh, and set the, the the electric power that would be supplied to these pumps. So remember that electric power is voltage times current. So the voltage supply is usually 12 volts. So this is usually driven by a 12 volt battery. Um, and uh, and the current is something that we can control through dialing uh, through a rheostat or or, or, or or something similar. So the power supply to the motor, this is electric power, is equal to the voltage times the current. In addition, the Elba pump power is related to the pump flow through and the head gain through the, this hydrodynamic relationship. Remember that hydrodynamic power is essentially pressure times flow. As electric power is voltage times current, hydrodynamic power is pressure times flow. The head gain times the density of mercury and gravity is the actual pressure. This is the pressure gain in the pump. And the flow that it produces, QP, multiplying that produces uh, the, the power. This is not pressure. This is power of the pump. This is a hydrodynamic power. Well, this is the electric power. Now, the two are connected. The two are connected through an electrical efficiency, through a power efficiency of, of the motor and the pump itself. So, in, in the ideal case, this motor power will be equal to the pump power. So, the electrical power is equal to the hydrodynamic power. But in reality, there's an efficiency in between. It's very high efficiency because electric motors have very, very high efficiency when it comes to transmitting, to transmitting power. So if we equate the motor power and the pump power to an efficiency, an efficiency, this results in the following. This is eta is a number between zero and one, usually very high in the order of 0 0.95 or something like that. So the pump power, hydrodynamic power, is equal to eta times the motor power, the electric power. Furthermore, then we can establish a connection, basically equate this to this, equate voltage and current to the hydrodynamic power and the efficiency in the metal, and then solve for HP. There it is. So this is the result of equating one equation to the other and solving by and solving for HP. Notice that I um, have eliminated eta. Eta would normally go in here. So the, the efficiency will go right here and here. And I've eliminated because I've actually compiled or compressed all those values into a parameter called eta. So essentially I took um, the density of mercury, the gravity, and put that into a parameter called eta, or coefficient called, um, called gamma. And that coefficient gamma is 7,495 millimeters of mercury, millimeter second volt amp. So it's essentially one divided by the density of, uh, uh, of, of mercury and gravity. So what do we do with the efficiency? Now, if we go back a few slides, you will remember that we introduce in the set of equations a resistance for the pump and an inductor for the pump. These two themselves actually are losses that are incurred inside the pump itself. And therefore, they act as an efficiency, as a power transmission efficiency between the motor, between the electrical power supplied to the motor then transform into mechanical power of rotation, and then transfer into the pump. These are losses that are incurred within the pump that we can actually quantify and that we can actually use as part of that efficiency of transmission between one or the other. So essentially, these, these coefficient called gamma, which is nothing but a scaling factor, is nothing but a, a, a one divided by the density of mercury and gravity to equate these two equations, it's essentially, essentially would already contain information about how the power is transmitted because we're already using a resistance for the pump and we're already using an inductor for, for the pump. So basically now we have that the head of the pump is a function of the voltage supplied to the motor, the current supplied to the motor, the scaling factor gamma divided by the, that, by the flow that is actually resulting from the pump. But remember that the flow itself QP is a state variable, a state variable number six. So we're going to take this equation for HP, plug it into position number six of the right-hand side vector, and what we end up with is, an, is a coefficient that has the flow in the denominator. And the flow, if we go back one more slide, is state variable number six. However, now it shows up in the denominator on the equation on the right-hand side. Therefore, this is a nonlinear term, one that we have to be very, very careful about and one that we actually have to control very precisely for the system not to blow up.
if you have flow in the denominator of any portion of this equation and that flow turns to zero, for example, the equation will blow up because one over zero goes to infinity. Same thing if it goes negative, for example, because then you will end up with a positive pressure head or something like that that will completely destroy the solution process. So at the end of the day, we have this equation. We have an equation for HP as a function of the inverse of the pump flow, which we'll introduce on the right hand side, right? So the right hand side vector was HP divided by the inductance, the total inductance. And now we're replacing that uh, HP by gamma, voltage supply to the motor, current supply to the electric motor, divided by the pump flow, which is simply Y6. Notice that uh, because of the inverse relationship with the pump flow, there's an unavoidable nonlinearity in the state system. Now you no longer can avoid the nonlinearity. Before, in the original set of equations we had, let me go back to the original set of equations, this one, we had this nonlinearities induced by the diodes, by the valves, okay? Because we have Y1 and Y2 multiplying a function of Y1 and Y2. Technically, that's a nonlinearity. But this function H is a, is a, is a step function. It's either zero and one. So we actually avoided those nonlinearities by switching the system between open valves and closed valves and altering what the matrix looks like. So moving stuff from this vector over back to the, to the matrix, uh, depending on what the state of this valve is, zero or one. So that's what's called an avoidable nonlinearity, something that you can actually uh, embed into the matrix and, 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 uh, and switch between different conditions. This new term right here is a non-avoidable nonlinearity because it results in a term that has a state variable in the denominator. There's nothing you can do about that. It will, it will be a nonlinear term and therefore it will be a very, uh, a very, uh, a strong force of instabilities in the solution process, in the numerical solution process. One that we have to be very careful about, one for which we have to adapt the time stepping and we have to um, make sure that we validate this number before actually calculating the elements of this vector because that number cannot be zero or negative because it will make this entire vector blow up and therefore the solution process completely blow up. So this uh, we'll, we'll look into implementing uh, next lecture. We'll take all of these equations, augment the system now to a six degree of freedom system or a system with six state variables, uh, and then look at what we do with this new, uh, this new state variable Y6, so the flow of the pump. And then um, once we uh, make proper treatment of it and, uh, and uh, make sure we, we stabilize it in the solution, then we can see what the LVAD actually does uh, in the cardiovascular system. And then we can play with the parameters of the cardiovascular system. So say, for example, alter the values of the, of the, of the double heel function so as to make that patient have a congestive disease. There's, that, is, that is, for example, decrease the value of E max, which is the maximum elastance of the system, decrease it to a value where uh, that, is, that is lower, sort of indicating that, uh, that, that the heart is not actually functioning properly. We can play with the values of the systemic circulation, the systemic resistance. We can play with the values of the heart rate. And also, actually, we can play with the values of the pump itself, the LVAT and tune it to, to produce more flow or less flow, and then see what happens. So this is what we're going to do next lecture uh, when we implement these in the, in the system of equations. Okay, well, thank you for your attention, and, and I'll see you next class.